Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on the people's feet. Before I explain this passage of scripture, I must answer the question, who is Jesus referring to? When he used the pronoun you, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus answered that question in, from verse 2 through to 12. It says, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the what? Poor in spirit. For there is, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You know, if the, if the world had a beatitude, it would go something like this. Odin. Blessed are those who are famous. Blessed are those who are wealthy. Blessed are those who get what they want when, it, when they want it. Blessed are those who have great possessions. That would be the world's version of beatitude. But Jesus, my brothers and sisters, came down from heaven not only to demonstrate what heaven is like, a characteristic of heaven is like, but Jesus also tell us what heaven values. Jesus also tell us the measuring stick that heaven has, the value system of heaven. Because sometimes we can get it twisted, even within the church. Are we together? Sometimes we can lose focus as to what heaven values. And that's why the psalmist, in Psalm chapter 37 and verse 1, the entire psalm, if you read the entire psalm, a beautiful psalm, the psalmist says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land and verily you shall be fed. The psalmist says, I have seen the wicked spreading themselves like a green bay tree. But they shall soon be cut down like a grass. What do you say? Sometimes we can get it twisted. To think that if you're godly, if you're humble, then you won't make it in life. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Meaning those who recognize their true spiritual condition, who recognize their deep need for God. And therefore, blessed are those who mourn over their own sinfulness, over the sinfulness of others. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those who long to be like God. Blessed are the meek. Those who endure suffering wrongfully and not lose their cool. Are we together? Blessed are those who are called peacemakers and those who are merciful. Because when you understand yourself and you practice righteousness you will learn to be merciful to others. And Jesus says, the, these are the persons who are persecuted for righteousness sake and you can rejoice because you are like the prophets whom they are persecuted. Jesus now looks at those who are blessed and he says, you are the salt of the earth. So those, that is a you, that is a pronoun that Jesus is using. And when he used salt, I want you to understand that it was a high compliment. 
Because salt is a precious commodity. Well, I mean, it's still precious, but in the, in the time of Christ, it was even highly, more highly regarded. Salt is a chemical that is used to preserve, purify, and season food. It is considered one of the most important minerals of the earth, ranking with gold and iron. It was nicknamed in, the, in those times the white gold because it was one of the most significant substances in history. The Romans used it as a means of paying their soldiers. And that's why it was such a precious commodity. And today when we say we get our salary, that word, Latin word, is actually coming from the word salt. That's how precious Jesus feels about those who are blessed. And there are three things that the, the, the metaphor teaches about the Christian in the world. Number one, it teaches us about the difference that Christians make in the world. Number two, it teaches us how we make a difference. And number three, it explains the tragedy of when a Christian loses saltiness. Number one, you see, as salt, Christians are both preserving and seasoning agent. And I want to start with being a seasoning agent. What Jesus is saying to the believer, to the Christian, to the one who is blessed, is that anywhere you go, you will make a difference. Are we together? Even if people don't notice your presence, your absence will be significantly recognized. When you are poor in spirit, when you are spiritually humble, when you are meek, when you are merciful, when you are pure in heart, when you are a peacemaker, you will make a difference. You will make a difference in your home. You will make a difference in your community. You will make a difference at your workplace. You'll make a difference in the world. Why? Because while everyone else is rendering evil for evil, salt to people love their enemies. You're not with me. <laughs> because if you, follow the, if you follow the trajectory of the Sermon on the Mount, these are the people that Jesus commands to love their enemies and to do good to them that hate them. And to pray for them that persecute them and despitefully use them. These, Jesus says, are the salt of the earth. While people are angry and revengeful and cruel and ungodly, God's people will have a, make a difference because they don't behave that way. You're not with me, brethren. This is the purpose that God called Abram. And God had such confidence, you see? God had such confidence that he could call one family and say, come here, Abram. I'm going to bless you, and through you and your family, the entire world will be blessed. In that with me, brethren. Jesus understood the power of influence so much that he was confident that his work in and through the life of Abraham, though he was one family, would have a pervasive influence that would salt the entire world. You see, when you are a chef, or let me not say chef, when you cook like myself, and you take up that salt and put in that pot, you are confident that the food is not going to be fresh. Because of the work that salt does. My sister is saying, are too salt. <laughs> he knows the difference that you will make if you possess these characteristics. If you're poor in spirit, if you're meek, if you're pure in heart, if you're a peacemaker, if you're hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be a seasoning agent in the world. 
Secondly, not only are you a seasoning agent, but you are a preservative, you're a preserving agent. And you might suggest that by being called salt of the earth, Jesus is saying that we are the agents through which God works to save humanity and to preserve the world from complete moral corruption. I hope you got that. Jesus is saying that by being in the world, you are the one who preserve the world and keep it from going down a path of being completely corrupted. And that's why when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, God, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And God says, if I can find 50 righteous, I will destroy it. And Abraham, you know the story, negotiated down to 10. Because Abraham is thinking that as salt, Lot must have had some influence on somebody in Sodom. Lot must have made a difference in his own family and that difference would have been spread like a ripple in water. But little did Abraham know that Lot had lost his savior. We come into that. In the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 7 and verses 1 to 3, an angel crying out to the angels who hold back the winds of strife, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Just as our God would not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot and his family came out. Brothers and sisters, God will not destroy this earth until his people are secured. The same thing happened in Babylon. That by being in Babylon, you know, God, God is just an amazing God. The way God worked to accomplish things is different from how the world accomplished things. God sent four young men to Babylon. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And through the influence of these four young men, God turned Babylon upside down. Are we together, Virgin? God brought the king of the greatest nation on the earth on his, to his knees through the work of four young men. That is the power of salt. I hope somebody get the sermon today. <laughs> Did I come here in vain? Can somebody get the message that God has confidence that when you're a salt, you will make a difference? When he sent Joseph to Egypt, Joseph testified. In Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph testified that God sent me here to preserve life. Even though it was his brothers who maliciously sold him into slavery, Joseph, when he looked back, when he traced the, provident, the work of providence in his life, he realized that God sent him there. To preserve life. And the only way he could have done it is if Joseph submitted and surrendered himself to God fully. You see, I could have come here, brethren, and tell you that you need to go and preach the gospel into all the world. Are we together? You need to go and witness to your neighbor. But let me tell you something. By the end of this sermon, you should understand that if you are not salt, you can't make any difference. When you are salt, your presence must help people to think about their sinfulness. Your presence must help people to think about the grace of Christ. Your presence, the, the, the conversations you have, the way you approach your work. You're not one of them who go to work and waste and mark time and then collect your paycheck at the end of the month. You're one of them like Daniel when even his enemies tried to find something wrong with what he was doing. They couldn't find anything because he's salt. He makes a difference. Are we together? People must notice you. When everybody is fighting and strategizing and 
and, 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 and conniving. You are doing what the Bible says you should do. And that's why the Bible says, blessed are the meek, because the meek will suffer. Are we together? The meek will have to endure persecution. The meek will have to endure unfair treatment and still be meek. That is salt. And when you are salt, you must make a difference. The second lesson that this metaphor teaches about the Christian is how we make a difference. You see, with this metaphor, Jesus focuses on the impact we make by being present. In other words, for salt to work, it can't remain inside this container. You must take it out and put it inside the pot. I hope you're following me. So, for salt to make a difference, it makes no sense to tell the salt, salt, go and salt. No, you have to put the salt there for it to make a difference. And that is how salt becomes influ influential. It must be present. And that's why Ellen White says that for the Christian to become an instrument for salvation, he or she must come close to the people. And she says, Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. What did the Savior do? The Savior mingled with men. <laughs> Are you following me? Salt can't make a difference if it doesn't mingle with people. If it doesn't come close to people. And some of us as Seminary Adventists and as Christians... We are so isolated from people, we don't know how people think. We don't know how the unbeliever think. We are so isolated that we cannot relate to what the unbeliever is going through. You're not with me, brethren. We just stay by ourselves. And we condemn people. We can't understand why they do the thing they do. As Rick Warren says that some of us have been Christians so long that we forget how the sinner thinks. And so we can't enter into their sorrows and into their needs and identify with what they need to come. And that is why Jesus operated the way he did. If you notice, when he wanted to reach Samaria, he found a woman who needed help. What do you say? And he came close to her. He says, give me some water to drink. That is a high, he was giving her a high honor to serve him with water. And through that conversation, Jesus turned Samaria upside down. So it teaches us the impact that a Christian will make by being close to people. Evangelism does not only involve pitching a tent and preaching and making noise abroad. That is important. But evangelism has to do with connecting with your neighbors. What do you say? It, it has to do with being friends with people. Being kind to them. Identifying with their faults and their weaknesses. Rather than condemning them. Loving them. Jesus was accused of eating and drinking with sinners and publicans. Why was he among them? Because... He is salt. <laughs> and he wanted to make a difference. What do you say? The Christian does not socialize out of a mere love for pleasure. The Christian, Ellen White says in the book, These Half Ages, socializes to save. So when we go to play football with a gentleman, we can't behave like them. We must make a difference. Are we together? We can't cuss and quarrel and fight like them. We must make a difference. This is a purpose for which God called Abraham and Israel. But Israel mistook their calling to think that to, to preserve righteousness, they must preserve themselves. <laughs> they must isolate themselves. And the same thing happened with the Christian church. In the, in the early 4th century A.D., when these Christians wanted to preserve godliness, 
they established the monasteries. And so they, they became monks to go and isolate themselves from the world so that they will not be contaminated by the world. But this is a misuse of your calling. And as Seventh Adventists, we have to be careful that we do not fall in the same trap. What do you say? The final thing that salt teaches us about our Christian life is the tragedy of losing one's saltiness. The what? The tragedy of losing one's saltiness. Jesus says, he says, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on the people's feet. It was Matthew Henry who commented, salt is a remedy for unsavory meat, but there is no remedy for unsavory salt. To lose your saltiness means to lose the grace of Christ. You are no longer a source of blessing to the world. Are we together? You, know, you can no longer influence them for good. Your presence makes no difference and your absence even worse. You possess the name, but you lack the power. Let me show you something. When you go into your kitchen and you're ready to cook your food and to salt your food, salt the rice or the meat or the tofu, <laughs> you look in that cupboard and you see sugar, you see salt, you see seasoning, and you take on the salt and put some in the food. If that food come out fresh and you know you salt it properly, like myself, I don't, I don't taste food by the way. When I'm cooking, I don't like to taste food. I, I believe I must have a good judgment as to how much salt the food needs. If you put that salt in there and the food come out fresh, you're going to feel betrayed. You're not with me, brethren. You're going to feel betrayed because you know you put salt in the pot. If it was named sugar, you could understand. Are we together? But the name is salt. It reminds me of the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 downwards. Jesus accused Sardis of something. Jesus says, you have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. This is referring to Christians who have a name, but you're not living the life. They are named seven Adventists, but they are not poor in spirit. They are not meek. They are not peacemakers. They do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. They are named Christians. But they have lost their saltiness. Jesus is saying, when I put a Christian somewhere and it doesn't make a difference, the problem is not with the salt. The problem is that it lost its savor. Jesus says, when I call you to go and assign you to work in this place, I place you there to make a difference. But if you end up living like everybody else and fight like everybody else, it means you have lost your savor. And Jesus feels betrayed. He feels like he wasted his effort in putting the Jews in the world. Are we together? That's why Jesus sent them to Babylon. But at the end of the day, only four Jesus could find to make a difference. And the same calling he has upon the seventh day Adventist church, the remnant church of Bible prophecy. What do you say, brethren? This remnant church is called to make a difference. We are called to proclaim. We are called to be stent, yes, all of that is important. But at the end of the day, Jesus is asking you, if I place you to work 
at the mandible tax office, for example, will you make a difference? Will people know that you're a salt? Will people become convicted of their sins because of how you live your life? Because of how you manage your transactions? Because of how you operate in relation to your co-workers? Are you salt? <laughs> or have you lost your savior? The problem with the Jews is that they became too focused on outward conformity. Are we together? And that's why Jesus presented the Sermon on the Mount like he did. Because when Moses presented on the Mount of Blessing, Moses focused on obedience. If you obey, you are blessed. If you disobey, you are cursed. The Jews had taken heed to that, but their obedience had become so legalistic that Jesus couldn't trust it. Are we together? And that's why he said, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. You will not have any influence on people if your righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you are truly salt, you are going to love your enemies. If you are truly salt, you are not going to hate your brother in the heart and pretend that you're a Christian. You know, when I, when I began to take the Bible seriously, I remember as a young man, I, I surrendered my heart to Christ and I bought a Bible over there in the shopping center and I began to read the Bible. Yes, I grew up in the church, but no, I was reading the Bible for myself. I was shocked at the things I found in the Bible. Because when I look in the Bible, and the Bible say, forgive. Are we together? And the Bible say, love your enemies. And I look in the church, and I see big people keeping malice. I, it was confusing to me as a young man. When I see adults, being at odds with each other and can't learn to forgive each other. I'm wondering if I'm reading the same Bible that they are reading. Are you salt? Have you lost your savor? As I said, I could have come here and tell you to go and witness. Go and preach the gospel. But Jesus, by this metaphor, you see the metaphor of light... Jesus said, salt and the light. The light represents the public effort, what people will see. But the salt represents that inward change and transformation that is necessary for light to shine. If you are not salt, you can't be light. Because when people see the name... <laughs> When people see the name and they come closer, they'll be disappointed. It reminds me of what Jesus says to the, to the Jews. You, 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 have, you are called yourself, this is a house of prayer that you have made a den of thieves. When people see the name, same the Adventists, but when they come close, they feel something else. The only way for that to change is when personal work takes place in the heart. Jesus says to this man, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, but to this man will I look, he that is of a contrite spirit and a broken heart, the one who recognizes sinfulness, the one who is meek, these are the people that heaven values. So before I close, I want to say something to the meek. I loved Psalm 37. Are we together? When you have the chance, if you're going through problems right now, if you're, if you're thinking that people are, are trying to use you and abuse you and, and trying to misuse you, read Psalm 37. Jesus says, Trust in the Lord. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. 
don't be envious of the workers of iniquity because they shall soon be cut down like a grass and wither like the green herb. People will be in the church and they are not, un, they are not godly, they are ungodly, but they are the ones getting ahead. Don't worry yourself. Humble yourself before God. And in his time, he will reward you. God bless you.